Okay, yeah, we were talking about filtration and reabsorption. You remember filtration is plasma in the interstitial fluid and reabsorption is from the interstitial fluid back into the plasma. And really when we look at a capillary bed, it's basically two-sided. You have the arterial side, you have the ventral side, and as the blood filter, uh, moves through the capillary, its chemistry changes enough where the pressures from hydrostatic and colloid influences are going to change on either side of that capillary bed. Uh, so we already went through and did all the math and calculated our net filtration pressure, which is going to be primarily occurring on the arterial side. Now as water and nutrients and particles and molecules are moved out of the arterial side of the capillary, we're changing that chemical makeup. And by the time we get over to the venule side of the capillary, we're actually going to have so this is what's going on in the venous and we're going to have a completely different chemical makeup and that's going to change our osmotic, our hydrostatic pressure and our colloid osmotic pressure. So on the venous end of the capillary, the blood hydrostatic, so the blood hydrostatic pressure is going to be about plus 10 millimeters of mercury, right around plus 10 millimeters of mercury. And then the uh, tissue fluid, which I'm just simply going to refer to as the fluid hydrostatic pressure, is going to be right around minus 3 millimeters of mercury. Okay, or we could call that a pole of plus 3 millimeters of mercury out of the blood. So taking those two numbers there, we, heat, we can also calculate the net hydrostatic pressure for this side of the capillary. And that net hydrostatic pressure is going to be plus 13 millimeters of mercury. Okay, And that net hydrostatic pressure in the venial, venial, the venual side of the capillary um, this is actually going to favor, it's still going to favor uh, the uh, movement of water across into uh, the tissue bed. So we're actually going to continue to have uh, an influence pulling the solution out based off of the hydrostatic pressure. But when we look at the osmotic pressures, the colloid osmotic pressures, The colloid osmotic pressure in the blood plus 28, and then the colloid osmotic pressure in the tissue is going to be a plus 20, no, nope, um, minus, minus 8. Uh, Minus 8. So plus 28 and minus 8, and if we go through and do all of the math here, our narcotic pressure equals plus 20 millimeters of mercury. Now, when I set up, so that's, remember we have net, the net hydrostatic and the oncotic is basically the influence of the hydrostatic pressure on, from both fluid compartments and then the influence of the colloid osmotic pressure from both fluid compartments. Now if I take and, and uh, uh, look at the net hydrostatic pressure and the oncotic pressure, I can calculate what is going to be referred to as the net reabsorption, the net reabsorption pressure, okay, and net reabsorption pressure, similar to our calculation for our net filtration pressure, we are going to take our hydrostatic pressure, which was plus 13, and we are going to subtract 
our colloid, uh, our oncotic pressure, which was plus 20. And when we go through and do that, we actually end up with minus 7 millimeters of mercury. So filtration pressure, remember that the uh, hydrostatic pressure was plus 33. We now have a hydrostatic pressure of plus 13. The oncotic pressure really didn't change that all, all that much. It's plus 20 both here and then in the um, uh, arterial side. So the drop in the hydrostatic pressure because of that change in the composition of the bloodstream as we move through the arterial to the venal side of the capillary bed is significant enough that we now are going to favor reabsorption. So again, remember the plus would be from plasma into the tissue minus means that it's tissue back into the plasma. So we have a driving pressure that favors movement of solution from the tissue back into, uh, back into the, the bloodstream. So we have absorption of interstitial fluid back into the plasma. Now one thing that I'm just going to note here, we're actually going to come back and we'll talk more about this um, when we pick up with the lymphatic system, which is actually going to be the next thing that we talk about. This, there, there is a difference, right? Because remember that our filtration was plus 13 millimeters of mercury, and our net reabsorption on the other side is minus 7 millimeters of mercury. That means there's an imbalance. And what that really translates into is, and I'll just draw some arrows to kind of represent this, there is more water entering the tissue than is leaving the tissue. That's why the arrow is bigger. There's a bigger influence. If this was minus 13, it would be equal. We'd have the same pressure going in, the same pressure coming back out. So just to kind of think ahead a little bit, what would be the consequence of this? More water or more solution going into the tissue than is being picked back up through reabsorption. Okay, it's getting overloaded. What do you mean by that? It's taking on, taking on okay, so we're going to actually begin to trap fluid in our tissue. And that's going to lead towards uh, the people I know. I've got a couple of you who are working in a clinical setting now. And have you ever had to manage edema? So that would be, if we don't regulate this somehow, this imbalance, you would build up tissue that's called edema. And it's actually, we're going to find out the lymphatic, lymphatic system's responsibility to balance out this pressure difference and this um, accumulation of additional fluid inside of the tissue. Okay? Hopefully all of this makes sense. There's a lot of math there. But basically what it comes down to is we have pressures induced by the presence of water and induced by the pressures of protein in the bloodstream. And those pressures change as we move across the capillary from one side of the capillary to the other, which causes a switch in the overall influence of how the fluid is going to move across that barrier of the capillary wall. Can you say that it's more going in than Yeah, so if I, let, let me actually, so let me, let me kind of highlight this a little bit better. So this is my blood, this is a capillary, okay? Here's the arterial side of that capillary. Here's the venule side of that capillary. The influence is such that the arrow should be bigger on this side, indicating there's more stuff leaving because it's a higher, it's plus 13. And remember, plus and minus is just simply plus means going out, minus means coming back in. So a plus 13 is going to have a much bigger influence going out. So plus 13 here, minus 7 on this side. The minus just simply says, okay, it's coming back in. And the magnitude is 7, and so I would have to draw a smaller arrow to represent that less fluid actually comes back out. So to put this in terms of um, some volumes, maybe let's say that over a 25-minute period, this accounts for 25 milliliters of blood that, or of solution that comes in. But over on this side, it actually only has a recovery back in of 17 
milliliters of solution in that same 25 minute period. So I'm leaving in that 25 minute period, I'm leaving uh, 8 milliliters of blood, 8 milliliters of blood inside of the tissue. So I'm filling that tissue space up. It would be like if I came over here to Rachel's Coke and I poured in some water, it would have additional volume. And there's no mechanism pulling that water back out. And that would be really cheap. Does that make sense now? I got some confused faces. Okay, do we know how to ask any questions or are we just going to sit here and stay confused? Can we just go home? <laughs> Is it is it with the hydro is it with the pressures that it's difficult to understand? We're not really understanding where the pressures are coming from, or are we not understanding the consequences of those pressures changing? Wow. So that's what I mean outside of tissue. Yep, so tissue is up here. So what is in here? The blood, the tissue, and what's so what are you exactly going? What's going in? What's yeah. what's the arrow? Well, I mean, like, if it's not blood, is blood the blood? Is it? It's basically the plasma. Yeah, and so the, the solution, remember plasma, we did the whole blood sample, and you all were able to draw that relatively well. And so we have hematocrit down here, we have our buffy white coat in here. This is what is actually being exchanged. It's the plasma that's dissolving the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, the waste products, the, the nutrients, and the raw materials. Anything that's dissolved in this solution is what's actually going to cross through that capillary wall. Now the, the impetus to move is coming from not the pressure induced by the left ventricle, but by the pressure of the fluids that are inside of that solution. And I gave the example with hydrostatic pressure. Let's say I take a, a vial, um, not a vial, a, um, a beaker of water, okay? So here's my beaker of water, and I have another beaker of water over here. And I put in some sort of device that's going to measure, that's a pressure transducer. It measures the pressure of the water. You're all familiar that as you go deeper and deeper into the lake or the ocean, pressure increases, right? Yeah. Okay, so pressure is increasing. And the reason that is is because more and more of the pressure, or more and more water is, is weighing down on it. However, you also all will know that if I take an egg and I put it into um, uh, clear water, just normal fresh water, what does the egg do? Anyone know? It actually sinks. And then you put it in salt water and it floats. And that's because changing, so if this is just pure water here, and then let's say we have sodium chloride here. The influence of the little particles of sodium chloride they are consuming space, right? Now imagine that this isn't even an open system. Let's say that I actually have some sort of plunger or something here that's blocking. So I mean, I can pour salt in there and the level of the water would just increase. But what if I prevent that? What if I make it a closed system? Which is what we're dealing with in the circulatory system, right? Left ventricle, everything is closed from left ventricle all the way back to right atrium. So whatever is in the fluid, it doesn't have much room to, to fill up or anything like that. So I take my closed system and I begin to add in sodium chloride. Now the water just can't rise on its own. It's going to hit that barrier and it's going to begin to build pressure. Does this make some sense? So that pressure transducer, if this is the graph here, so we're measuring the changes in pressure on both of these. As I add the salt in there, pressure is going to just kind of start to go up. Whereas over here, without changing, pressure is going to stay constant. Okay? What's happening here with the, and in addition, by the way, the water is just going to have an inherent pressure as it is. If I take it and uh, so I have my closed system here again, have my pressure transducer, my pressure transducer, and let's say I have a little fill valve here and I can turn that fill valve on and this is going to allow water to go in. And we have a mechanism where we can release the air. Okay, so there, there's the model system. Measure the pressure in the, in the container with just air in there. And I'm going to get a certain pressure reading. 
And then I begin to let the water go in there and I fill it up with water and measure, remeasure the pressure. The pressure is going to be different because the fluid is different. It's no longer air or oxygen. It's now water. And its pressure is different. And that's called hydrostatic pressure. So there's an influence of hydrostatic pressure. The more water that's present in a closed system, the higher the hydrostatic pressure. The less water that's present, the lower the hydrostatic pressure. In addition, as we start to add particulates in there, proteins or ions, they also begin to in exert influence and pressure. So inside of the capillary, if we look at the capillary, oops. So we look at the capillary. This is my arterial side, and this is my venous side. This is, for all intents and purposes, a closed system. Let me let me let me step back because I'm going to confuse you. The whole thing is a closed system, but it can exchange across this wall. I can have exchange. So if I have my fluid in here, my blood inside of uh, inside of the capillary, it's going to have a hydrostatic pressure influenced by the amount of water that's present, and it's going to have a colloid osmotic pressure influenced by the number of particles that are present. Same thing out here with my intracellular fluid. Based off of the amount of water that's present, there's going to be a certain water characteristic. Based off of my um, uh, my solutes that are present, there's going to be a certain colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, is everybody rel following me relatively well right now? Mm -hmm. So I have those different influences, and the whole system is closed, but if we look at the capillary wall, the capillaries have those slits in them. <laughs> the junctions between the cells are, are not real tight, and so we can actually move that solution across the membrane based off of the prevailing pressures that are present. Okay? On this side, on the arterial side, we have a lot of water that's present. We have a lot of solutes that are present. And it favors movement of water in those solutes, the plasma component of the blood, to filter through the capillary wall. Now, as that's happening, what is happening to the characteristics of the blood as it passes through this through this capillary? It's staying constant or is it changing? It's changing. And how is it changing? Is the water going up or down? Is the solutes going up or down? Solutes are probably going down as well. And in all reality, the solutes really aren't changing all that much. But they are changing some. And the reason they're not really changing all that much, individually, they're changing a lot. If I look at glucose here, it's going in. But if I look at um, the amount of carbon dioxide, it's actually filling up with carbon dioxide. So I have this exchange of those raw nutrients and in one direction in the, uh, the, the uh, waste products in the other direction. So a bunch of water is flowing in here. By the time I get over here, is this portion of the, of the blood identical to this portion of the blood. They look very much different. So the pressures are now all very different. Hydrostatic pressure has actually dropped significantly. Okay? What about up here in the, uh, in the interstitial space, the, the tissue fluid? What's happening over here on this side of our model? Is water going up or down? It's going up because it's getting pulled out of or pushed out of the blood. What about over here? It's actually going to be decreasing. But overall, what's happening is as water fills up on this side, as water comes in on this side, it's influencing what's happening over here on this side. So by the time we get over here, if we take a blood sample, if we take a sample of the interstitial fluid, it's going to look very different on this side versus on this side. Now those differences that we see on either side of the capillary bed, those differences are going to influence how the water actually moves, how the plasma moves across the membrane. On this side, it's favored to move into the tissue. Okay, so I guess I would draw the arrow like this. It comes into the tissue. 
causing the composition of the fluid over on this side to continually be going up in reference to water. On this side, because there's higher water here and I'm losing water as I move through the capillary, it now influences water to lead back into the capillary. Is this helping? Okay, so based off of that conversation, now do we have additional questions we can ask? Are we a lot more confident in what's going on here? Okay, Jason. Go ahead. Like the difference between the two, like when you were drinking, is that what the eight numbers like in pre-digit part thirteen minus twenty? Is the amount of sediment? Is that what that is? Is the difference? Yeah. So you have a hydrostat. So let's let's um, let's reinvent our model here. Okay, so in, in the blood here, in the tissue here, in the tissue here, and in the blood here, we're going to have a colloid osmotic pressure here and a hydrostatic pressure here. We're going to have a colloid osmotic pressure here and a hydrostatic pressure here. We're going to have a colloid osmotic pressure here and a hydrostatic here, a colloid osmotic pressure here, and a hydrostatic pressure here. Okay? It's just like if I were to borrow this coke here, this coke actually has a hydrostatic pressure and a colloid osmotic pressure as well. And it's probably very different than the colloid osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure that's out here uh, in the environment. Or if I were to take this and throw it into a cooler of ice water, I have a barrier. I have a solution or a fluid on one side of the barrier and a fluid on the other side of the barrier. And they're very different from a hydrostatic and a colloid osmotic perspective. If this became permeable, I would begin to see exchange based off of those pressures. Um, so yeah, those numbers that I've given you, we start out and we basically say, okay, what's the hydrostatic pressure for the blood as it enters into the artery? And we call that P cap. Okay, so that was the pressure in the capillary. And then we also had P if which was the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid. And those numbers, as we go across the capillary, from one side of the capillary to the other side of the capillary, are changing. Because we're losing water, which is the component of the solution that's adding to the hydrostatic pressure. So as water gets pulled out, we have the decrease in the hydrostatic pressure. Okay? So those are where those no numbers came from. Um, and, and the numbers that I gave you are basically, they don't really line up uh, perfectly with this figure. You can see that PCAP on this side is, um, they're saying, okay, that's 38. And the number that I gave you was, was 28. Um, it's really close, actually. If you go through and look at all of the numbers on that figure or figures in your book, they line up in magnitude. It's not like I'm giving you, oh yeah, PCAP here is zero and the collate osmotic pressure in the blood is, is 28. <laughs> They're actually, the ratios are, are going to hold. Well, it, in the arterial blood, it, it's not totally a constant. It's going to depend on hydration status of the individual and other factors like that. And the PCAP changes from one side of the capillary to the other side. So PCAP in, that, that I gave you for the arterial end, the PCAP that I gave you there, the hydrostatic pressure, was about 30 millimeters of mercury. And then the, what would be the PCAP, the blood hydrostatic pressure uh, in the blood capillary on the venous end was plus 10. So we went from plus 30 to plus 10. And that relates to the fact that we've now removed a whole bunch of water. We start out with a large amount of water on this side, so high water on this side, and then much lower water on this side in the blood capillary because the water is moving out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid. And so the water here inside of the inside of the capillary on the venous end is much less than it was on the arterial side. Does this change? Like, because you know, 
when you take pressure into different parts of the body, it's going to be less the further away you get. Okay. Is that affecting it at all? So um, that's not the right pressure. And what I what I mean by that is because this is composition. The yeah, the pressure, the, the pressure that you're measuring, let's say you measure brachial artery pressure and it's 120 over 80, that relates to the pressure being induced by the ventricle. So that's a mechanical pressure pushing on the fluid to cause it to move. That fluid, inherent to the fluid, has a hydrostatic pressure and has a coward osmotic pressure in the fluid, regardless of what's going on inside of the heart. By the time you get to the capillaries, I don't know if I can find that picture really quickly. So by the time you get to the capillaries, pressure is, I mean, we're at 25. For the, for the blood pressure, the pressure induced by the left ventricle, it's much, much lower there. And in fact, that capillary pressure from the blood, uh, from the pumping of the heart, the pressure inside of the tissue is very close to being that pressure. Just in the tissue fluid itself. So this is composition of the blood, the water component and the, and the particle component of the blood are going to influence what the, the pressures that we can measure and experience in the blood and in the tissue fluid are actually going to look like. So I guess my question then continues to, what, why do we see activity that at certain points in the body more particularly the That's a great question. Um, and it has very little to do with the dynamics of the blood. It actually has a lot more to do with the dynamics of the lymphatic system. Um, we're going to actually come back and we'll talk about that. Let me give you just a little brief kind of introduction here. So if this is a tissue bed, you know that I have capillaries running through there. And then we'll go with our purple dotted line. I'm also going to have blind-ended lymphatics. In those blind-ended lymphatics, there is that, there is that, um, the, the imbalance of blood coming out of the capillary, so that on the venous side, I have less blood that's, or less water that's being picked back up. And so some of the water actually, we, we are continually increasing the water content of the tissue. That increased water content is supposed to be picked up by the lymphatic vessels. The lymphatic vessels will drain that tissue and account for that extra uh, five, seven, or eight millimeter of mercury pressure induced by the imbalance of water being put into the tissue. Now, to move the lymphatic fluid back up to the heart, it actually the, the lymphatic vessels they drain um, basically the subclavian vein. Okay. So the right and left subclavian veins, we have a lymph, we have interaction between the lymphatic vessels and the circulatory system. To move all that stuff back up, all the f fluid back up from the capillaries through lymphatic um, vessels, lymphatic ducts, lymphatic trunks, we actually are fighting against the force of gravity. There is no pressure in that system, so we use skeletal muscle pump and we use changes in respiration to help to move. The, the, the uh, uh, lymphatic uh, material, the lymph, back up towards the heart. Now, in certain situations, you actually have reduced compliance of the lymphatics, and they don't pick up and move the water as well. One extreme example that I can point to, maybe you'll be able to see green. What if I blocked that lymphatic capillary there? What if there was some sort of blockage in that lymphatic capillary? What would be the consequence? You would have water left over, and you would not be reverting that. Um, you would not be reversing that imbalance, and water would begin to collect. There is a parasitic worm that is very prevalent in third world countries that actually will act as a blockage of lymphatic capillaries, and it induces a condition that you're all very familiar with because you've looked at the, the images probably on the internet before called elephantiasis, where you get these huge uh, buildups of tissue fluid and the, the limbs of those individuals and all their body parts begin to look very much like elements. So we just block that lymphatic capillary and that imbalance remains and the tissue fluid builds up. Yeah, Paige. Yep. Thanks for the reminder.
Are there any other questions? We kind of deviated there um, a bit. Are there any other questions on the impetus to move fluid across the capillary bed related to those hydrostatic and colloid osmotic pressures and they change from one side of the capillary to the other side? Yeah, Meredith. So you said earlier that like all the yeah, it's plus 13 and then minus 7. We all have that imbalance. That imbalance is normal. And it's actually important that that imbalance is normal because we want to generate lymphatic lymphatic fluid. We want to generate lymph because the capillaries, you can't pick up really, really big molecules like lipids. They actually get picked up by the lymphatic uh, capillaries because they're they're more loose. The only way you're going to be able to move a solid like a, like a lipid is if it's put into a solution and can be pulled in in that solution. So this balance is actually very important that it, that it exists because it helps, especially when you eat uh, food, and let's say you have uh, a hamburger, and that hamburger's got that really delicious fat in it. You want to be able to pull those nutrients in because those lipids are going to be utilized to generate new um, membranes around your cells and around your organ else. If we could, if we had to rely on the capillary to do that, the capillary is not porous enough for those really, really large molecules. Capillaries only allow relatively small molecules to cross through the capillary wall. So we need to have that in balance so that we have a solution that can be produced for larger molecules. Even some of our hormones that are bigger get picked up by the lymph system first and then get drained into the circulatory system after they've traveled up the lymphatic vessels. So people with like is that this like well, Yeah, well, I don't really know all that much about the physiology of congestive heart failure, but um, a lot of those people, they, um, when we get down, and, and, and yeah, they have edema, they, they're probably putting in additional, additional fluid into the tissue, above and beyond the, the plus 13. Um, they may have issues with the lymphatic drainage as well. I guess I'm not really too sure uh, to be perfect, just to speak very honestly about that. The other thing too with edema, and a lot, you maybe have had some minor edema as well. I get it occasionally, especially if I've been standing up lecturing for a long period of time. Um, a couple semesters ago, I, was, I lectured in, on, on Mondays, I lectured seven hours. And I was on my feet the whole time, and I would get home, and my ankles would be a little bit puffy. And then I'd lay down and go to bed, get horizontal, and I'd wake up in the morning, and it would be all resolved. And part of it was I was just not probably moving the lymph because I've seen so much. Gravity was was pulling down and having its effect. In addition, I probably was because I was on my feet for seven hours. I was busy, and I probably really wasn't eating. Properly, I wasn't hydrating properly, and it, they, the consequences are what would be minorly pathophysiological with a little bit of a deal. I mean, it, it occasionally is going to happen. Even in young individuals like you, or plane rides, you go and you sit on a plane for 12 hours flying over to Japan or something like that, and you get up and you're like, holy cow, my legs are killing me, and you got some puffiness or some swel swel swelling in your legs. And you get up and you start to move around and walk around a little bit and you accelerate your heart rate that kind of resolves on its own pretty quick. It's a little bit of a little bit of leftover edema. Okay. Um, everybody have all of everything they need here. Let's go ahead and we will take the last six minutes of class here and we will finish up with one last minor detail. I'm not sure why I put this here, but I did. Um, 
probably should have talked about this when we talk about conduction system in the heart. But as you're aware, the heart has its own electrical activity. So the heart has your, its own electrical activity. And this electrical activity is actually a very important clinical measurement or metric. In other words, we can use the heart's electrical activity to really evaluate and look at how well the heart is functioning. Um, in lab, have you done a, have you set up PCGs yet, or is that, you just did. Okay, so you see the characteristic electrical activity of the heart, which is known as the PQRST formation. Okay, so the, Q, the PQRST formation or PQRST way, you'll be aware that you put on those little pads and then hooked up the electrodes. And those electrodes are picking up the electrical activity in the heart. So the, the, the way that I can sort of explain this is an electrode is a field of view. So right now I'm looking at Rachel, and from this perspective I can see her face, and I can see the front of her, and I can see that she's wearing rain boots. But if I go over here, I get a different perspective. Now I have more of a profile, I can see she's wearing a headband, I can see that her hair is in a ponytail, I can't really see what's on the front of her jacket. So those electrodes are basically giving you a field of view around the heart. Okay? The heart is going to have different... Um, ventricles and atrium depending on where you're looking you're going to be able to look at the, the the field of view that you take is going to look at different parts of the heart right so over uh, you put an electrode over on the right side you can look at the right so the electrode that's up here which you would call r a right arm electrode you can actually look at the activity going on in the right atrium the electrical activity of the right atrium then you had your left arm and your left leg, and you're looking at the left side of the heart. Then you had those precordial leads, those precordial electrodes that went around the heart, and it basically was sort of like taking and mapping out what's going on in the heart. And you kind of run through right atria, right, atria, right ventricle, septum, what's going on in the septum, look around the left ventricle. So you look at the interior wall of the left ventricle, the lateral wall, and the posterior wall. Okay, so that's what the electrodes are doing. You're actually looking at the electrical activity from a variety of different perspectives inside of the heart. And the way that the heart forms or shows its electrical activity is the PQRST formation. And the PQRST formation should be relatively normal, and it should look very similar to this. Now, what you can see on this figure are the different waves but then you also have what are called both intervals and segments that make up this figure or this waveform. The waves are just simply going to be named PQRST, which I was, I'm, I'm dumb, and you're all like, no, you're not dumb, but I'm really kind of dumb. And when I was learning this, I was like, why did they use PQRST? And it never occurred to me that they just started with P and they went through the alphabet. <laughs> but that's how they named it as they started out. They said, okay, so it's P, Q, R, S, T. And then occasionally a U shows up. U, we don't really know why it exists. And a lot of people don't even have a U wave. So for all practical purposes, you can kind of ignore it. The P wave is simply going to be the electrical activity that we see in the heart during atrial contraction. The QRS is referred to as the QRS complex. So the QRS complex, and that is the electrical activity in the heart as the ventricle is depolarizing. Okay. 
Now you can also say that that's going to be ventricular during ventricular contraction, right? Because we have contraction during depolarization. And then we have the T wave, and the T wave is going to be ventricular relaxation, relaxation, or ventricular uh, repolarization. So as the heart is resolving after the contraction. And then you have each of these segments, and these segments are going to change uh, in, in their length. So the segment is, is kind of detailed here in black. So you have a pukey, a pukey, you have a PQ segment, and then what's really important is going to be that the, the ST segment. And when something happens, whether it's a heart attack or some other um, uh, effect with, a, with maybe medicine or something like that, as the heart changes its function, the electrical activity changes as well. And you can see that. So you'd have a normal heartbeat where the, the, the peaks of the QRS complex come at a very regular interval. If it's faster, they're just coming along quicker. And we call that tachycardia. If it's slower, they come along still at a regular rhythm, but slower. We call that bradycardia. And both tachycardia, normal with exercise, bradycardia, it's normal in well-trained individuals. My heart rate, normal heart rate is 60 beats per minute in the morning for most, uh, most humans. When I was well-trained as a cross-country skier, my morning heart rate was about 38 beats per minute. So it was very bradycardic. It was totally normal. And really, it just was related to the fact that you just didn't require as much blood at a given unit of time because your body was so efficient. But then occasionally things are going to happen, and you might get an irregular beat, or you might get a QRS complex right in the middle, just kind of randomly. And those all could be indicators of clinical problems. And there's actually a variety of different what we call arrhythmias or dysrhythmias. Basically, changes or deviations in what the heartbeat looks like, the QR, the PQRS complex, that show up uh, in a variety of different ways and it have a variety of different appearances. One thing that you may get is just a series of P waves with no QRS complex. And you can say, oh, I'm just getting P waves. The atria is just contracting. The ventricles aren't contracting at all. And we'd call that atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. Those are two different atrial um, issues. Not going to get into a whole lot more detail on dysrhythmia. That would be a whole class in, its, in itself. But I do want to bring up one last thing as we finish this chapter up, and then I'm going to let you go. We know that the P wave represents atrial contraction and atrial depolarization. What about atrial relaxation or atrial repolarization? When does that happen? Or is it happening? It has to happen, right? We have to, so that we can recontract. The, the reason you can't see it is because it's stuck here behind the QRS complex. The electrical activity in that real muscular tissue, especially the left ventricle, as it goes through its contraction and you have that signal, it just masks everything else out. All the other electrical activity, it gets masked out. There are actually some techniques that you can use where you can actually see the repolarization of the of the right atria or of the atria, but the ventricles usually mask everything out as they contract because contraction of the atria of the ventricle is occurring juxtaposed to the relaxation of the atria. So the atrial relaxation we say is just hidden behind the QRS. <coughs> 